So I know what you're probably thinking right now. You're thinking, how is it that a single-celled organism called a prokaryote is able to navigate an environment and avoid predation despite having no nervous system and no brain to speak of? Well, the answer might have something to do with something called fascia. So fascia is a type of connective tissue that runs through an entire organism, not only supporting its structures, but potentially also acting as a kind of communication system and sensory organ in lieu of a nervous system or in addition to a nervous system. It turns out that we have one of these as well, and by better understanding how to use fascia and how to keep it healthy, we might be able to boost our mobility, our strength, and our general performance. So stay tuned, and in this video, I'm gonna explain exactly how you might do that. It's gonna be fascinating. His furger? It's a furger. His fascia. You know, the fascia. In my video on tendon strength, I explained that it might not actually make sense to think of individual muscles, but that we should rather consider them as muscle tendon units. The two work together to such a degree that it's more useful to think of them as a single functioning unit. But perhaps it's folly to consider any part of the muscular system in isolation, or the body for that matter. Consider that your entire muscular system is wrapped in a film-like substance called muscle fascia. For many years, it has been largely ignored by the fitness community, thought of as the inert stuff that was just there to fill the gaps. But if there is one thing we should know about the human body, is that it doesn't waste space. Understanding the muscle fascia and incorporating it into your training might just be another important tool for enhancing strength, increasing mobility, boosting agility, and much more. But there's also some misunderstanding and hearsay surrounding fascia, so let's take a closer look. To recap then, fascia is a brand or sheet of connective tissue located beneath the skin and made from collagen. Its role is to separate, stabilize, and enclose muscles and organs. There are actually three layers of fascia, those being the superficial fascia, deep fascia, and visceral fascia. Superficial fascia is found just beneath the skin in the subcutis of most regions of the body. Visceral fascia suspends organs in their cavities, but the type we're most interested in is the deep fascia, which surrounds the muscles, bones, nerves, and blood vessels. It helps to divide muscle groups into fascial compartments and contains a large amount of elastin fiber to determine its elasticity. Most specifically, we're interested in muscle fascia or myofascia, which is in turn a type of deep fascia, and thereby it can store and return potential energy, while also influencing and perhaps limiting an athlete's range of motion. When you sprint, it's not just your muscles and tendons that provide energy rebound then, but also your fascia, particularly those fascia tissues with tenderness or aponeurotic properties. When you stretch, your fascia needs to stretch too. Fascia is far more than just a supportive springy wrap though, it also contains blood vessels and sensory receptors. In fact, it's been suggested that the fascia may be equal or perhaps even superior to the retina in terms of its density of sensory nerve receptors. It has between 6 to 10 times more nerve endings than the muscle, and fascia also contains its own smooth muscle cells, which are thought to contribute to fascial contractility. In short, healthier fascia could result in greater physical strength more explosiveness, greater flexibility, and even improved balance and agility. So how do we go about getting there? Roll on a tennis ball, right? Sort of. So if you've already heard of the muscle fascia, then it's probably in the context of self-myofascial release. This is the practice of rolling on foam rollers and tennis balls until it really hurts. The thought is that this can increase range of motion without impairing muscle performance or strength. Stretching before workouts has recently been demonstrated to potentially decrease performance and increase the likelihood of injury. Basically, you become wobbly. But increasing range of motion can surely be helpful for movements like the squat. So if rolling on a ball can help you to touch your toes without robbing you of any of your strength, then that's definitely a good thing. Indeed, this has been shown to be the case in several studies. Likewise, self-myofascial release may be effective in reducing chronic pain and has been shown to aid recovery by reducing DOMS when used after a workout. If you want to see the effects of massaging the fascia for yourself, then try touching your toes. Tricky, right? Now take a tennis ball and place it beneath the arch of your right foot. Place some weight on that foot and then really let it dig in there. Now roll it around a little, making sure you get the whole thing. This should be a little uncomfortable, but not searing agony. Now do the same thing on your left foot. And now try touching your toes again. If our little experiment has worked, then you should find you can now touch your toes more easily than you could before. This demonstration was popularized by structural integration expert Tom Myers, and it sheds light on just how incredibly connected the fascia is. How does massaging your foot affect the tightness of your calves, hamstrings, and glutes? It comes down to the fact that fascia is connected across your entire body, and according to Myers, we can separate our fascia into five major chains, with those being the superficial back line, superficial front line, lateral line, spiral line, and deep front line. 
The superficial back line starts at the bottom of the feet and continues all the way over the top of the head, ending at the brow ridge. By loosening the fascia under your feet, you actually help it to relax across the entire posterior chain, thereby increasing the range of motion in a few seconds flat. Others have suggested though that we really only have one fascia. It's also worth noting as well that fascia can vary a lot in terms of its thickness and its composition depending on its location. But point is, it's all very connected, and that's why rolling on one part of the body can have effects across your entire anatomy. So far so good, but the bad news is that we currently don't have much of an understanding of precisely how this all works. Read a number of popular blogs and they'll tell you that it has to do with breaking up myofascial adhesions. The theory goes that scar tissues form in the fascia over time, thanks to misuse and overuse, resulting in a change in fascial architecture that makes it rigid and tight. By applying pressure in these areas then, it's thought that we can break up that scar tissue and help to regain normal movement. The only problem is that there's zero evidence for this. Moreover, when you understand the fascia a little bit better, it becomes apparent that it's highly unlikely that this is how the whole thing works. After all, those collagen fibres are actually proportionately as strong as steel, and it's therefore very unlikely that you'd be able to break down any scar tissue or change the structure of the fascia through force alone. It actually takes collagen about three years to completely remodel. As others have pointed out, if it were really that easy to break up your fascia, then you'd do it all the time. Like when you're sitting on your buttocks watching this video for instance, and applying far more force over a long period than any bout of foam rolling will accomplish. Then there's the fact that the benefits of foam rolling only appear to be temporary in nature. The increased range of motion wears off after a while, so your job in the gym is to capitalise on that window of opportunity to lay down new movement patterns. If that's the case though, then it seems unlikely that we're actually changing the physical structure of the fascia. Also, if it were so easy to break up scar tissue in the fascia, wouldn't it be quite dangerous to attempt this on our own? Wouldn't we risk damaging healthy fascia and causing more harm than good? Fortunately, it appears that something else is actually going on here. While this is still just a theory, the more likely explanation that's rising to prominence at the moment is that foam rolling and similar practices actually help to temporarily relax tension in the fascia rather than break it up in any way. Remember, your fascia contains muscle fibre, not to mention mechanoreceptors that respond to touch. Books such as Relax and to Stretch show us the link between relaxing the nervous system and increasing range of motion. Basically, when we move beyond a certain safe point, the nervous system will kick in, causing tension to prevent us from injuring ourselves. It's even been suggested that the fascia may act as a communication system, carrying electrical signals between muscle groups and nerve endings. This would further explain how relaxing the fascia in the foot might help to ease movement in the legs. And I wonder if it might also have something to do with muscular irradiation, the observation that contracting one muscle will cause others around it to contract in kind. Basically, the fascia seems able to conduct electrical impulses so that tensing or relaxing any muscle will cause a kind of ripple effect across the body. This is another reason it's so important to look after your fascia. If you don't, then it'll lead to compensatory movement patterns that could greatly increase your chances of injury down the line. Something as seemingly simple as tightness in the foot could lead to tightness in the knee, which might lead you to squat badly and hurt your back. Some massage therapists now employ a technique called fascial unwinding, based on this concept, applying light pressure to sensitive areas in the fascia in order to trigger relaxation of the surrounding muscle. It may also be that fascial release helps to somehow override the pain mechanism thus allowing us to increase range of motion without the nervous system kicking in to halt our movement, much like PNF stretching. I actually suspect that there are a lot of similarities between PNF stretching and myofascial release, and many studies focus on comparing these two. For those that don't know, PNF stretching is proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. This form of stretching involves contracting the muscles in a stretched position and then relaxing them. You can learn more by checking out my video on weighted stretching. So what does this teach us? Firstly, don't be so keen to buy into every new technique and explanation offered by fitness blogs. Secondly, the best way to practice myofascial release may actually be with a gentle, relaxed and targeted pressure. Don't target the site of pain, but rather the surrounding muscle tissue, avoiding any bony areas. When you feel a kind of release, then that is where you want to work gently deeper into the region. Avoid areas like the lower spine and instead target muscles that feel tight or restricted. Popular choices include the calves, hamstrings, glutes and quads. I personally have quite tight calves and I find that myofascial release has greatly helped me to increase my range of motion. But don't forget the upper body too. Do all this at the start of your workouts and then stretch at the end. But this is still somewhat theoretical like I say and I wager that the fascia harbours yet more secrets. I actually also wonder whether performing body scan meditations could help to relieve tension in the fascia and increase mobility and proprioception that way. This form of meditation involves focusing on each part of the body 
In some versions, practitioners then begin contracting the muscles in the region and then consciously allowing them to completely relax as much as possible. This is useful for getting into a state of relaxation, but perhaps it could also be useful to release tension in the muscles and the surrounding tissues. Try actively relaxing your face right now and you'll see how much tension there is even in those small tiny muscles. It's also just a theory, but maybe using this meditation for 10 minutes prior to training could help you to attack workouts with greater focus, improved mind-body awareness, and less injury-causing tension. I'll be experimenting with that and I'll get back to you. There are some other things you can do right now to make more use of your fascia. One is to recognize that your fascia works best when it's well hydrated. Fascia is moist to the touch, and when it dries out, it can lose flexibility and become more brittle. Moisture also helps the fascia to glide over other tissue rather than sticking. So keeping yourself well hydrated is, as ever, really important. What's more important though, is that you also need to incorporate a range of different movements into your training. Movement helps to keep the water flowing to those areas and might also help to keep the micro vacuoles open. It seems that a lack of motion can cause the fascia to become brittle and rigid, in a specific region. So if you're just repeating the same five movements in the gym over and over, this will contribute to your loss of mobility and flexibility. Keep your body guessing and adapting, and ideally get outside and start training on unpredictable terrain. Swing, climb, swim, trail run, and you'll keep your fascia limber. Perhaps even running barefoot or using more minimal footwear could help to provide some benefit here. Train with functional chaotic movements by using your body weight, using kettlebells, using old time strongman lifts. Just don't be predictable and machine-like. And if you want to encourage the elastic and explosive nature of fascia, then incorporate explosive plyometric movements. Either way, it's time to start thinking of the body as a single cohesive mechanism. We're not a series of joints and muscles. Our body is rather one huge, interconnected and highly complex machine. We need to start treating it and moving it as such. So I hope you found this video useful and interesting, guys. If you did, then please consider leaving a like. That helps me out immensely. Uh, share it around, that also helps. In fact, one of the very best things you can do for this channel is to share my videos on Reddit and places like that. I hugely appreciate all your support, all your comments, and your likes and your shares and your comments and your subscriptions. They've all helped the channel to grow immensely lately, and I'm hugely grateful. I've got tons more on the way on fitness, brain training, productivity, all the usual stuff. Also this week, I have something really special and different coming, so keep your eyes tuned to the channel. It's gonna be awesome. So thanks a ton for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.